This is not a drill. I repeat, this is not a drill. Do not be afraid. We are now in control of what you hear. One, two, three, testing. A journey to the far reaches of knowledge and the unknown. I can't believe I just saw that. From aliens to angels, conspiracies to cover-ups. One soul and preeminent power. From extraterrestrials to exposing the truth. I'll try to explain as much as I can. You're listening to Planet X. You're listening to Planet X. Planet X. This is Breaking the Matrix. I am Tony Topping. This is Planet X. Planet X. Atos to be canonized by the Catholic Church. Atos, the French company that has been charged by the Department for Work and Pensions to determine the disability payments for the people of the UK, will be canonized by the Catholic Church after a criticism from leader of the opposition, Ed Miliband. Basically, said Ed Miliband, I said that after Atos had been put in charge, the number of disabled claimants had been unfairly reduced by 30,000 people. People who were disabled last week were not disabled this week. The Pope, the elected representative of God on Earth, at least according to one religion, got wind of this comment and investigated. We have investigated the claim, said Deacon Mission, head of the Catholic Church Sainted Department, and we concur with Mr. Miliband's assessment that Atos has made 30,000 people no longer disabled. That is a better rate than Jesus! He only managed it with a handful. 30,000 is impressive by anybody's standards. Atos have successfully made the blind able to see, the paralyzed able to walk, and in five cases brought back five people who were officially dead. Such a miracle requires recognition, said Mission, and for this reason Atos will be beatified and later canonized once the paperwork has gone through. This will be the first time that an organization has been made into a saint by the Catholic Church, but probably won't be the last. We have heard that Finnus have managed to feed 5,000 people using just four fish, said Mission. That too is a miracle, whilst BP have managed to create a plague of dead rotting fish upon their enemies. The Catholic Church has finally realized what governments have realized a long time ago. Organizations can be classed as people and treated as such. In an ironic twist, Atos will be the patron saint of the out of work. It's breaking the matrix, it's 10pm, I am Tony Topping. The Muslim Brotherhood and its supporters have begun forcing the roughly 15,000 Christian cops of Dalga village in Egypt to pay a jizya tax, as indicated in Quran 9.29, author and translator Raymond Ibrahim reported on Sunday. Jizya is the money or tribute that conquered non-Muslims historically had to pay their Islamic overlords with willing submission and while feeling themselves subdued to safeguard their existence, Mr. Ibrahim explained. According to Yunis Shakwa, who spoke yesterday to Dosta reporters in Dalga, all cops in the village, without exception, are being forced to pay the tax. The value of the tribute and method of payment differ from one place to another in the village, so that some are being expected to pay 200 Egyptian pounds per day, others 500 Egyptian pounds per day, Mr. Shawik said, according to the translator. In some cases, families not able to pay have been attacked. As many as 40 Christian families have now fled Dauga, Mr. Ibrahim reported. The taxes are not unique to Egypt either. Just over the weekend, Syrian rebels went into a Christian man's shop and gave him free options. Become Muslim, pay $70,000 as a tax levied on non-Muslims known as jizya, or be killed along with his family, Christian Science Monitor reported. So, round of applause all around there to HMG, who are funding the rebels in Syria. Well done them. You're listening to Planet X. Planet X, the biggest paranormal show on radio. Reporter Megan Keneally 
of Associated Press. A reports Obama's war on Syria is really about Iran and Israel instead of chemical use, claims critics as highlighted in an article in the Daily Mail. Critics of President Obama say that he has been hiding the true reason for the proposed military strikes on Syria and actually wants to topple the Iranian government. The skeptics think that in spite of his impassioned principal pleas to gain support so the US can hit Syria in response to their alleged use of chemical weapons, the real motivation for becoming a player in the country's civil war is to prevent any harm being done to Israel. The Nation correspondent Bob Dreyfus called the proposed intervention in Syria much lobbied for, illegal and strategically incompetent, and all based around the mass goal of protecting Israel. Should the US strike, experts fear that either Syria or its ally Iran will retaliate, and one of the most likely targets is Israel. American ties to Israel have been around since the country's creation, and President Obama has reiterated those close corrections throughout his term. The White House has intrinsically linked the Syrian conflict and Iran, a country that openly hates America. Between now and Tuesday, when Congress votes on the prospect of military action in Syria, Mr. Obama is forced to convince a majority of representatives that the strike is in America's best interest. In doing so, the prospect of a retaliatory Iran has been regularly brought up. Mohammed Zarif, the foreign minister of Iran, made a pointed statement during a visit to Iraq on Sunday, warning that his country would like America to stay out of the region. I do not know why those who say all options are on the table do not understand the fact that civilized countries 65 years ago rejected in the Charter of the United Nations the resort to force as an illegal practice, he said. In an effort to drive the point home, he broke away from his native Farisi during a press conference to say these words in English in comments clearly directed at the United States and its allies. The president said that if America action is taken, it will not involve soldiers being shipped to Syria. This would not be another Iraq or Afghanistan, Obama declared in his weekly radio address, previewing arguments he will make in a nationally televised address on Tuesday. I know that the American people are weary after a decade of war, even as the war in Iraq has ended and the war in Afghanistan is winding down. That's why we're not putting our troops in the middle of somebody else's war, Obama said. Israel is not taking any chances that there will be retaliatory measures taken at their expense. The Israel military has deployed an Iron Dome de missile defence battery in the outskirts of Jerusalem. Israel is concerned that Syria or a group allied with the regime like Hezbollah based in Lebanon could launch missiles at Israel if the US attacks over its alleged use of chemical weapons against civilians. Even though Israel believes it's unlikely that Syria will attack the Jewish state, it is making preparations just in case. It has deployed air defense systems, drafted a small amount of reserve soldiers and is handing out gas masks. The Iron Dome system has shot down hundreds of rockets launched by Hamas militants in the Gaza Strip and Israeli cities. Planet X. The truth is on air. A Syrian village is liberated by rebels who then force Christians to convert to Islam, reports the Mail Online. Dated the 8th of September 2013, Syrian rebels, including Al-Qaeda-linked fighters, have gained control of a Christian village northeast of the capital of Damascus. Government media has provided a different account, suggesting regime forces are winning. The battle is taking place at Malula, a scenic mountain village where people still speak the ancient Middle Eastern language of Aramaic. Terrified Christians claim Syrian rebels ordered them to convert to Islam on pain of death when they liberated their ancient village. Opposition forces, including fighters linked to Al-Qaeda, gained temporary control of the Christian village of Malula after fighting with regime forces. The reports have reignited fears about Western support for the rebel groups which are increasingly being infiltrated by Islamic extremists. On one at Malula, a resident said the rebels, many of whom had beards and shouted Allah Akbar, God is great, attacked Christian homes and churches shortly after moving into the village. They shot and killed people. I heard gunshots and then I saw three bodies lying in the middle of a street in the old quarters of the village. Where is President Obama to see what has befallen us? Another Christian resident said, I saw the militants grabbing five villagers and threatening them and saying, either you convert to Islam or you will be beheaded. Another said one church had been torched and gunmen stormed into two of the churches and robbed them. The beautiful mountain village, 25 miles from Damascus, is one of the few places in
in the world where residents still use the ancient language of Aramaic, which was spoken by Jesus and his disciples. It has become a key strategic battleground in the Syrian civil war because of its proximity to the capital. It was held by President Assad's regime, but taken at the weekend in a rebel advance spearheaded by the hardline Islamist al nazura Front. Villagers said they held several foreign accents among the rebels, with many feared to be Al-Qaeda fighters imported into the conflict. A villager said he heard mainly Tunisian, Libyan, Moroccan and Chechnyan dialects. In a video posted online, a rebel commando shouted at the camera, We cleanse the village from all the Assad dogs and all his thugs! But Syria's state news agency claimed the rebels had withdrawn and the regime had regained the village, saying the army had inflicted heavy losses in the ranks of the terrorists. McCarchyDC.com is reporting intercepts caught Assad rejecting requests to use chemical weapons, according to a German paper, says reporter Matthew Schofield. Berlin, Syrian President Bashar Assad has reportedly a rejected request from his field commanders for approval to use chemical weapons, according to report this weekend in a German newspaper. The report in Bild am Sonntag, which is a widely read and influential national Sunday newspaper, reported that the head of the German Foreign Intelligence Agency, Gerhard Schindler, last week told a select group of German lawmakers that intercepted communications had convinced German intelligence officials that Assad did not order or approve what is believed to be a sarin gas attack on August 21st that killed hundreds of people in Damascus' eastern suburbs. The Obama administration has blamed the attack on Assad. The evidence against Assad was described over the weekend as common sense by White House Chief of staff Dennis McDonough on CNN's State of the Union. The material was used in the eastern suburbs of Damascus that have been controlled by the opposition for some time, he said. It was delivered by rockets, rockets that we know the Assad regime has and we have no indication that the opposition has. Russia has questioned that, that logic, announcing last week that in July it filed a 100-page long technical and scientific report on an alleged March the 19th chemical weapons attack on a suburb of Aleppo that it says implicates rep fighters. A UN team dispatched to Syria to investigate the March 19th attack was sent to the scene of the August 21st incident. The samples it collected are currently being analysed in Europe at labs certified by the Organisation for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, the international agency that monitors compliance with chemical weapons bans. The German intelligence briefing to lawmakers described by Bildam Sontag fits neither narrative precisely. The newspaper's article said that on numerous occasions in recent months, the German intelligence ship named Ocker, which is off the Syrian coast, has intercepted communications, indicating that field officers have contacted the Syrian presidential palace seeking permission to use chemical weapons and have been turned down. The article added that German intelligence does not believe Assad sanctioned the alleged attack on August the 21st. Last week, the German news magazine Der Spiegel also cited a briefing for German legislators said that Ocker had intercepted a phone call between a commander from the Lebanese militant group Hezbollah and an official at an unidentified Iranian embassy saying that Assad had ordered the August 21st chemical attack out of anger. The Hezbollah commander called the attack a huge mistake, Der Spiegel said. It was not clear if the two news accounts were based on the same or different briefings. Assad told American journalist Charlie Rose in an interview to be broadcast in its entirety on Monday night on BPS that there had been no evidence that I used chemical weapons against my own people. Even if Assad didn't approve the use of chemical weapons, he's likely to be held responsible for its use by a rogue unit within Syria's security forces. David Butter, a Syrian expert with the British think tank Chatham House, called the German intelligence an interesting distraction but nothing more right now. To build a case that Assad had no role in the use of chemical weapons, we need a lot more evidence, he said. And of course, as head of state, if a war crime has been committed by his regime, he is ultimately responsible. The German intelligence report would seem to fit the European mood of the moment. However, the US military action must wait for the results of the UN investigation. What happened is all very murky, Butler said. Let's wait for the United Nations investigation before taking the next step.
A ministers on Saturday issued a statement calling the August 21st attack a war crime, but said nothing should be done without UN approval. New opinion polls over the weekend in France, Germany and Great Britain showed strong disapproval of military action in Syria. The British poll done for the Sunday Telegraph indicated only 19% of the population backs the idea of military action with the United States, while 63% oppose it. The polls in France and Germany showed similar margins of opposition. Meanwhile, a new tabulation of the dead from the August 21st incident raised more questions about Obama's administration's officials' account of what took place. The Damascus Center for Human Rights Studies, an anti-Assad group, said that it had been able to document 678 dead from the attacks, including 106 children and 157 women. The report said 51 of the dead, or 7%, were fighters from the Free Syrian Army, the designation used to describe rebels that are affiliated with the Supreme Military Council which the US backs. The report said that the organization was certain that more than 1,600 died in the attack, but that it had not been able to confirm the higher number. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry has said 1,429 people died on August 21st, including 426 children, but has not said how the United States obtained the figures. Other estimates have ranged from a low of at least 281 by the French government to 502, including tens of rebel fighters and about 100 children by the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, a London-based group that tracks violence in Syria. Reporter Megan Akineli of Associated Press reports Obama's war on Syria is really about Iran and Israel instead of chemical use, claims critics, as highlighted in an article in the Daily Mail. Critics of President Obama say that he has been hiding the true reason for the proposed military strikes on Syria and actually wants to topple the Iranian government. The skeptics think that in spite of his impassioned principal pleas to gain support so the US can hit Syria in response to their alleged use of chemical weapons, the real motivation for becoming a player in the country's civil war is to prevent any harm being done to Israel. The Nation correspondent Bob Dreyfus called the proposed intervention in Syria much lobbied for, illegal and strategically incompetent, and all based around the mass goal of protecting Israel. Should the US strike, experts fear that either Syria or its ally Iran will retaliate, and one of the most likely targets is Israel. American ties to Israel have been around since the country's creation, and President Obama has reiterated those close corrections throughout his term. The White House has intrinsically linked the Syrian conflict and Iran, a country that openly hates America. Between now and Tuesday, when Congress votes on the prospect of military action in Syria, Mr. Obama is forced to convince a majority of representatives that the strike is in America's best interest. In doing so, the prospect of a retaliatory Iran has been regularly brought up. Mohammed Zarif, the foreign minister of Iran, made a pointed statement during a visit to Iraq on Sunday, warning that his country would like America to stay out of the region. I do not know why those who say all options are on the table do not understand the fact that civilized countries 65 years ago rejected in the Charter of the United Nations the resort to force as an illegal practice, he said. In an effort to drive the point home, he broke away from his native Farisi during a press conference to say these words in English in comments clearly directed at the United States and its allies. The president said that if America action is taken, it will not involve soldiers being shipped to Syria. This would not be another Iraq or Afghanistan, Obama declared in his weekly radio address, previewing arguments he will make in a nationally televised address on Tuesday. I know that the American people are weary after a decade of war, even as the war in Iraq has ended and the war in Afghanistan is winding down. That's why we're not putting our troops in the middle of somebody else's war, Obama said. Israel is not taking any chances that there will be retaliatory measures taken at their expense. The Israel military has deployed an Iron Dome de missile defence battery in the outskirts of Jerusalem. Israel is concerned that Syria or a group allied with the regime like Hezbollah based in Lebanon could launch missiles at Israel if the US attacks over its alleged use of chemical weapons against civilians. Even though Israel believes it's unlikely that Syria will attack the Jewish state, it is making preparations just in case. It has deployed air defense systems, drafted a small amount of reserve soldiers and is handing out gas masks. The Iron Dome system has shot down hundreds of rockets launched by Hamas militants in the Gaza Strip and Israeli cities.
Get in touch with Planet X. Call, text, email. Find us on Facebook. A very interesting article in Haaretz indicates uh, by journalist Kemi Shalev that retired U.S. Army Colonel Lawrence Wilkinson, who once served as Secretary of State for Colin Powell's Chief of Staff, believes that the chemical weapons used in Syria may have been an Israeli false flag operation aimed at implicating Bashar Assad's regime. Wilkinson made his astounding assertion in an interview on Current TV, the networks once owned by former Vice President Al Gore and recently purchased by Al Jazeera. Wilkinson said that the evidence that it was Assad's regime that had used the chemical weapons was flaky and that it could be very well have been the rebels or Israel who were the perpetrators. Asked why Israel would do such a thing, Wilkinson said, I think we've got a basically geostrategically, geopolitical inept regime in Tel Aviv right now. I think we saw really starting evidence of that, Wilkinson continued, in the fact that President Obama had to tell Bibi Netanyahu, pick up the phone you idiot, Call Ankara and get yourselves out of this strategic isolation you're in right now. A false flag operation is a covert attack on foreign or domestic soil carried out by governments or organisations under a false identity aimed at placing blame on the enemy. It originates with a ruse once used in naval warfare in which ships would hoist the enemy's flags in order to infiltrate its ranks. Wilkinson, 63, a former army helicopter pilot who flew combat missions in Vietnam, served as Colin Powell's chief of staff in 2002 to 2005. He was responsible for reviewing the intelligence information used by Powell in his now famous February 2003 United Nations Security Council appearance of Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. After his retirement, Wilkinson described this presentation as a hoax and became an outspoken critic of the Bush administration's handling of the Iraq war. He now serves as a professor at Virginia William and Mary College and is a guest commentator on several US television networks. Speaking on the current Young Turks program, Wilkinson said that because of the instability in the Middle East, Israel's current geostrategic situation is as dangerous as it's been since 1948. He added that President Obama has got to be very circumspect about what he does in exasperating that situation. Netanyahu is clueless as to this, Wilkinson said. I hope President Obama gave him a lecture in geostrategic realities. Ray McGovern, a former intelligence officer with the CIA, writes a very interesting article from warisacrime.org. It's very interesting. He is part of veteran intelligence professionals for sanity, and his article, Who is Lying, Brennan, Obama, or both, is a very interesting read. The subject to the memorandum to the President Obama is... Is Syria a trap? And we regret to inform you that some of our former comb workers are telling us categorically that contrary to the claims of your administration, writes McGovern, the most reliable intelligence shows that Bashar al-Assad was not responsible for the chemical incident that killed and injured Syrian civilians on August the 21st, and that British intelligence officials also know this. In writing this brief report, we choose to assume that you have not been fully informed because your advisers decided to afford you the opportunity for what is commonly known as plausible denial. We have been down this road before with President George W. Bush, to whom we addressed our first VIPs memorandum immediately after Colin Powell's February the 5th, 2003 UN speech, states McGovern, in which he peddled fraudulent intelligence to support attack in Iraq. Then, also, we choose to give President Bush the benefit of the doubt, thinking he was being misled, or at the very least, poorly advised. And, of course, the fraudulent nature of Powell's speech was a no-brainer. And so that very afternoon, we strongly urge your predecessor to widen the discussion beyond the circle of those advisers clearly bent on a war for which we see no compelling reason and from which we believe the unintended consequences are likely to be catastrophic. We offer you the same advice today. Our sources confirm that a chemical incident of some sort did cause fatalities and injuries on August 21st in a suburb of Damascus. They insist, however, that the incident was not the result of an attack by the Syrian army using military-grade chemical weapons from its arsenal. That is the most salient fact. According to CIA officers working on the Syria issue, they tell us that CIA director John Brennan is perpetrating a pre-Iraq war-type fraud on members of Congress, the media, the public, and perhaps even you, writes McGovern. 
We have observed John Brennan closely over recent years, and sadly we find what our former colleagues are now telling us easy to believe. Sadder still, this goes in spades for those of us who have worked with him personally. We give him zero credence, and that goes as well for his titular boss, Director of National Intelligence James Clapper, who has admitted he gave clearly erroneous sworn testimony to Congress denying NSA eavesdropping on Americans, writes McGovern. Intelligence summary or political ploy? That Secretary of State John Kerry would invoke Clapper's name this week in congressional testimony in an apparent attempt to enhance the credibility of the four-page government assessors strikes Vips as odd. The more so since it was for some unexplained reason not Clapper but the White House that released the assessment. This is not a fine point. We know how these things are done, although the government assessment is being sold to the media as an intelligence summary. It is a political, not an intelligence document the drafters, massagers and fixers avoided, presenting essential detail. Moreover, they conceded up front that, though they pinned high confidence on the assessment, it still fell short of confirmation. Deja fraud. This brings a flashback to the famous Downing Street minutes of July the 23rd, 2002 on Iraq. The minutes record Richard Deal of the Hendri the head of British intelligence reporting to Prime Minister Tony Blair and other senior officials that President Bush had decided to remove Saddam Hussein through military action that would be justified by the conjunction of terrorism and WND. Dealove had gotten the word from then CIA Director George Tennant, whom he visited at CIA headquarters on July the 20th. The discussion that followed centred on the preliminary nature of the evidence, prompting Dealove to explain but the intelligence and facts were being fixed around the policy. We are concerned that this is precisely what has happened with the intelligence on Syria. There is a growing body of evidence from numerous sources in the Middle East, most affiliated with the Syrian opposition and its supporters, providing a strong circumstantial case that the August 21st chemical incident was a pre-planned provocation by the Syrian opposition and its Saudi and Turkish supporters. The aim is reported to have been to, to, have been to create the kind of incident that would bring the United States into the war. According to some reports, canisters containing chemical agents were brought into a suburb of Damascus where they were then opened. Some people in the immediate vicinity died, others were injured. We are unaware of any reliable evidence that a Syrian military rocket capable of carrying a chemical agent was fired into the area. In fact, we are aware of no reliable physical evidence to support the claim that this was a result of a strike by a Syrian military unit with expertise in chemical weapons. In addition, we have learned that on August the 13th uh, 20 or 14th 2013 western sponsored opposition forces in turkey started advanced preparations for major irregular military surge initial meetings between senior opposition military commanders at qatari turkish and u.s intelligence officials took place at the converted turkish military garrison in atkai hatay province now used as the command center and headquarters of the free syrian army fsa and their foreign sponsors McGovern continues that senior opposition commanders who came from Istanbul pre-briefed the regional commanders on an imminent escalation in the fighting due to a war-changing development which in turn would lead the US-led bombing of Syria. At operations coordinating meetings attended by senior Turkish, Qatari and US intelligence officials, as well as senior commanders of the Syrian opposition, the Syrians were told that the bombing would start in a few days. Opposition leaders were ordered to prepare their forces quickly to exploit the US bombing, march into Damascus and remove the Bashar al-Assad government. The Qatari and Turkish intelligence officials assured the Syrian regional commanders that they would be provided with plenty of weapons for the coming offensive, and they were. A weapons distribution operation, unprecedented in scope, began in all opposition camps on August the 21st and 23rd. The weapons were distributed from storehouses controlled by Qatari and Turkish intelligence under the tight supervision of US intelligence officers. Who benefits as McGovern? 
Well, that the various groups trying to overthrow Syrian President Bashar al-Assad have ample incentive to get the US more deeply involved in support of the effort is clear. Until now, it has not been quite as clear that the Netanyahu government in Israel has equally powerful incentive to get Washington more deeply engaged in yet another war in the area, but with outspoken urging coming from Israel and those Americans who lobby for Israeli interests, this priority Israeli objective is becoming crystal clear. A reporter writing from Jerusalem in an important article on Friday's New York Times addresses Israeli motivation in an uncommonly candid way. Her article, titled Israel Backs Limited Strike Against Syria, notes that the Israelis have argued quietly that the best outcome for Syria's two-and-a-half-year-old civil war, at least for the moment, is no outcome. The journalist Judy Roderan continues to say that for Jerusalem, the status quo, horrific as it may be from a humanitarian perspective, seems preferable to either a victory by Mr. Assad's government and his Iranian backers, or a strengthening of rebel groups increasingly dominated by Sunni jihadis. This is a playoff situation in which you need both teams to lose, but at least you don't want one to win. We'll settle for a tie, says Alan Pinkas, a former Israeli council general in New York. Let them both bleed, hemorrhage to death. That's the strategic thinking here. As long as this lingers, there's no real threat from Syria. We think this is the way Israel's current leaders look at the situation in Syria, and that deeper US involvement, albeit initially by limited military strikes, is likely to ensure that there is no early resolution of the conflict in Syria, that long Sunni and Shia are at each other's throats in Syria and in the wider region. The safer Israel calculates that it is. That Syria's main ally is Iran, with whom it has a mutual defence treaty, also plays a role in Israeli calculations. Iran's leaders are not likely to be able to have much military impact in Syria, and Israel can highlight that as an embarrassment for Tehran. Iran can readily be blamed by association and charged with all manner of provocation, real and imagined. Some have seen Israel's hand in the province of the most damaging charges against Assad regarding chemical weapons, and our experience suggests to us that such is supremely possible. Possible also is a false flag attack by an interested party resulting in the sinking or damaging, say, of one of the five US destroyers now on patrol just west of Syria. Our mainstream media could be counted on to milk that for all it's worth, and you would find yourself under still more pressure to widen US military involvement in Syria and perhaps beyond against Iran, states James McGovern uh, in the article or memo sent to President Obama. Iran has joined those who blame the Syrian rebels for the August 21st chemical incident and has been quick to warn the US not to get more deeply involved. According to the Iranian English channel Press TV, Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javed Zarif has claimed that Syria crisis is a trap set by Zionist pressure groups for the United States. Actually, he may be not far off the mark, but we think your advisers may be chary of entertaining this notion, thus we see as our continuing responsibility to try to get the word to you so as to ensure that you and other decision makers are given the full picture. And McGovern writes, the former CIA agent uh, writes further to the president with this interesting inevitable retaliation scenario. He writes, We hope your advisers have warned you that retaliation for attacks on Syria are not a matter of IF, but rather where and when. Retaliation is inevitable. For example, terrorist strikes on US embassies and other installations are likely to make what happened to the US mission in Benghazi on September the 11th, 2012 look like a minor dust-up by comparison. One of us in, uh, addressed this key consideration directly a week ago in an article titled Possible consequences of a US military attack on Syria, remembering the US Marine Barracks destruction in Beirut in 1983. For the steering group of veteran intelligence professionals for sanity, and that was a memo directed at President Barack Obama. Erdi's channel Elvis has they twerk instead of tweet. Having problems lately with timely delivery of your tweets, you're not alone. Gail Farrelly, a science and technology reporter at thespoof.com, has found out that the Twitter birdies wanting to thumb their beaks at management for labour complaint issues, no paid overtime, infrequent breaks for eating and drinking, no company furnished raincoats and umbrellas for bad weather flying, have taken matters into their own wings and are spending more time twerking instead of tweeting. 
thoroughly skilled in bird talk, got the story straight from the mouth of the head bird, that would be Bill Twitter, the president of the Twitter Birdies Labour Union. The birds really enjoy twerking, confided Mr. Twitter, who commented, They find it a nice, loosey-goosey activity. It relaxes them. And their role model may surprise you. According to Mr. Twitter, his union membership is not at all interested in modern-day twerkers. Millie Cyrus, oh, please dump her back in the world of Disney, the head bird chirped, continuing. My birdies are fans of the late, great, swivel-hipped. Elvis Presley, with a little wiggle and an excited flutter of his wings, Mr. Twitter added. Now there was a guy who really knew how to twerk. I mean, he was doing it in the 50s, before the word twerk had even hit the dictionary. As Farrelly ended the interview, she was thinking of what Roy Orbison once said about Elvis. He was the firstest with the mostest. Exactly. This is Breaking the Matrix. I am Tony Topping. Technical journalist Bill Snyder comes up with a very interesting article regarding Verizon's diabolical plan to turn the web into pay-per-view. It would appear the carrier wants to charge websites for carrying their packets, but if they'd win, it'd be the end of the internet as we know it. Think of all the things that tick you off about cable TV, asked Bill Snyder. Along with brainless programming and crummy customer service, the very worst aspect of it is forced bundling. You can't pay just for the couple of dozen channels you actually watch. Instead, you have to pay for a couple of hundred channels because the good stuff is scattered among a number of overstuffed packages. Now imagine that the internet worked that way. You'd hate it, of course, but that's the direction that Verizon, with the support of many wired and wireless carriers, would like to push the web. That's not hypothetical. The country's number one carrier is fighting in court to end the Federal Communication Commission's policy of net neutrality, a move that would open the gates to a whole new and wholly bad economic model on the web. As it stands now, you pay your internet service provider and go wherever you want on the web. Packets of bits are just packets and have to be treated equally. That's the essence of net neutrality. But Verizon's plan, which the company has outlined during hearings in federal court and before Congress, would change that. Verizon and its allies would like to charge websites that carry popular content for the privilege of moving their packets to your connected device. Again, that is not hypothetical. ESPN, for example, is in negotiations with at least one major cellular carrier to pay to exempt its content from subscribers' cellular data caps. And what's wrong with that, you might ask? Well, ESPN is big and rich and can pay for that exemption, but other content providers, think of your local jazz station that streams audio, couldn't afford it and would be out of business or they'd make you pay to visit their websites. Indeed, if that system had been in place 10 years ago, fledgings like Google or YouTube or Facebook might never have gotten out of the nest. Susan Crawford, a tech policy expert and professor at Yeshiva University's Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law, states Verizon wants to cableize the internet. She writes in her blog that the question presented by the case is does the US government have any role in ensuring ubiquitous, open, world class, interconnected, reasonably priced internet access? Verizon then could be the new Standard Oil. Verizon and other cancer carriers can answer that question by saying no. They argue that because they spent megabucks to build and maintain the network, they should be able to have a say over what content travels over it. They say that because Google and Facebook and other internet companies make money by moving traffic over their networks, they should get a bigger piece of the action. Never mind that pretty much every person and business that accesses Google or Facebook is already paying for the privilege and paying more while getting less speed than users in most of Europe. In 2005, AT&T CAO Ed Whiteacre famously remarked that upstarts like Google would like to use my pipes free, but it ain't going to let them do that because we have spent this capital and we have to have a return on it. That's bad enough, but Verizon goes even further. It claims that it is a right to free speech, and like a newspaper that may or may not publish a story about something, it can choose which content it chooses to carry. Broadband providers possess editorial discretion, just as a newspaper is entitled to decide which content to publish and where. Broadband providers may feature some content over others. Verizon's lawyers... 
That's so crazy I won't bother to address it, but the FCC has done such a poor job of spelling out what it thinks it has the right to regulate and how that should work that the door is wide open for the carrier's bizarre, not to mention anti-consumer strategies and arguments, writes Bill Snyder. I don't want to get down into regulatory weeds. There is one bit of legalese that's worth knowing. Common carrier. Simply put, it means that the company doing the shipping can't mess with the contents. A railroad is a common carrier, and as such it can't decide whose cargo it will carry and whose it won't. And before railroads were common carriers, they did things like favour products made by John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil, which made him even richer and also led to the creation of a wildly out-of-control monopoly. Very interesting indeed, but the FCC has never ruled out that ISPs are common carriers, partly because it's afraid of the power of the lobbyists to influence Congress, and partly because its directors lack spine. And now that lack of spine is about to bite the butt of everyone who uses the web. According to people who follow this stuff closely, because ISPs are not common carriers, like the, the judges on the US Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C., are looking for askance at the FCC's defence against Verison's lawsuit, although a verdict isn't likely for months. Here are the stakes. If Verison or any other ISP can go to a website and demand extra money just to reach Verison subscribers, the fundamental fairness of competing on the internet would be disrupted. It would immediately make Verison the gatekeeper to what would and would not succeed online. ISPs, not users, not the market, would decide which websites and services succeed, writes Michael Weinberg, Vice President of Public Knowledge, a digital advocacy group. A taste of the web's future to come is the Time Warner vs. CBS dust-up, and you don't have to wait for Verizon's verdict to get a taste of what the new web order would be like. Time Warner Cable and CBS just had a dust-up over how much Time Warner would pay CBS to carry its programming. When the pair couldn't agree, the cable giant stopped carrying CBS programming in New York City, Los Angeles and Dallas. CBS then retaliated by stopping Time Warner subscribers from streaming its programming over the internet. They settled after about a month, staying true to form. Time Warner refused to give customers a rebate as compensation for lost programming. That's not exactly the same issue that we're facing in the fight over net neutrality, but it should give you a sense of what life is like when the giants fight it out over what you're allowed to access and for how much. Users get caught in the middle and the rights were taken for granted simply disappear. The world of zero hours contracts is a very interesting one. Interesting to note on Twitter that a major business guru indicated the, that zero hours contracts were needed for economic flexibility. Katie Hopkins wrote a witless article in support of zero hours contracts, saying that it brought new motivation to a workforce. As somebody said to me, they wouldn't be coming into work on a zero hours contract as and when needed because they needed another job to work, uh, to, sorry, to make ends meet. And interestingly enough, the TUC lodges a complaint against government for failing to give equal pay to agency workers, so says the Trade Union Freedom Campaign for. The Campaign for Trade Union Freedom reports that the TUC has today, September the 2nd, lodged a formal complaint with the European Commission against the UK government for failing to implement the Temporary Agency Workers Directive properly, leading to tens of thousands of agency workers being paid less than permanent staffs despite doing the same job. The TUC complaint says that the UK government's flawed implementation of the EU directive has allowed the abuse of the so-called Swedish derogation, where employment agencies routinely pay agency workers far less than permanent staff doing the same job. The TUC has gathered evidence from workplaces where agency staff are paid up to 135 a week less than permanent staff, despite working in the same place and doing the same job. Under UK regulations, agency workers are entitled to the same pay and conditions as permanent staff doing the same job after 12 weeks. However, a Swedish derogation contract exempts the agency from having to pay the worker the same rate of pay as long as the agency directly employs individuals and guarantees to pay them for at least four weeks during the times they can't find them work. In Sweden, where these contracts originate, workers still receive equal pay once in person 
robust and 90% of normal pay between assignments. However, in the UK, workers have no equal pay rights and are paid half as much as they received in their last assignment or minimum wage rates between assignments. Agencies can also cut their hours to receive as little as one hour for paid work a week. Evidence gathered by the TUC shows that Swedish derogation contracts are used regularly in all call centres, food production, logistics firms, that's lorry drivers working out of retail warehouses and parts of manufacturing. The Temporary Agency Workers Directive was implemented in the UK in 2011 as part of a European-wide legislation to give equal treatment to agency workers at the time business lobby groups warned that the legislation would lead to heavy job losses. But as with the minimum wage, their predictions proved to be completely wrong and the number of agency workers has increased despite the recession. Agency working in the UK has increased by 15% since the recession faster than any other form of employment. The directive said that the countries must prevent the misuse of Swedish derogation contracts. The TUC believes it has evidence that the UK government has failed to provide adequate protection for agency workers and that the right to equal pay is being widely flouted. Swedish derogation contracts should therefore for be banned, says the TUC. The number of workers on Swedish contracts has grown rapidly since 2011. Around one in six agency workers are now on these contracts, according to a report from the Recruitment and Employment Confederation. Employer organisations are often keen to praise the flexibility of these employment contracts, but the reality for many thousands of workers is job insecurity, a lack of basic rights at work, and in the case of many agency workers, pay rates far below that of colleagues who have permanent contracts, says the TUC. And the TUC believes that the growing exploitation of agency workers on Swedish contracts, along with the rise of zero-hours contracts and involuntary temporary work, show that behind improving employment statistics lies an increasingly insecure and vulnerable workforce. Unless the government acts to protect workers, the jobs market will continue to be dogged by low-wage, insecure jobs, says the TUC. TUC General Secretary Francis O'Grady said the recent agency worker regulations have improved working conditions for many agency workers without causing job losses. Yet again, business organisations have been proved completely wrong in claiming that decent rights at work cost jobs. How stupid. What a, what a stupid, how stupid is that? They're, they're in cloud cuckoo land, dear listener. Yet again, business organisations have been proved completely wrong in claiming that decent rights at work cost jobs. A complete, absolute planet are some of these business people on. And I, I run an own little enterprise. You can't work a, a business like that. Insane. However, the regulations are being undermined by a growing number of employers who are putting staff on contracts that deny them equal pay. Most people would be appalled if the person working next to them was paid more for doing the same job, and yet agency workers on these contracts can still be treated unfairly. When even Conservative MPs complain about the Swedish contracts, you know it is time for the government to toughen the law. That's why we are calling on the European Commission to investigate the problem and take steps to prevent the abuse of agency workers in the UK. The contracts are just one more example of a new growing type of employment that offers no job security, poor career progression and often low pay. People are often unable to plan and budget from one month to the next and energy bills are a struggle and home ownership is a pipe dream. The government should ignore the inevitable bleating from business that will follow the TUC's complaint and finally do something to help ordinary workers. Planet X, online, on your mobile. It is very interesting to note, dear listener, before we go to the Katie Hopkins article, a very interesting article uh, that is written by a former uh, sports uh, sports direct uh, somebody called Matt, a former sports direct employee. And very interesting how he uh, gains us an insight into the crazy world of zero hours contracts. I know somebody who worked for the same firm I worked for a while back. She's now on a zero hour contract, doesn't know where she's coming and going. She worked there, she's worked there a good number of years now, and all her loyalty for that company's gone out the window. So, as you can see, it, the business. Really, in general, with these zero hours contracts, it's beginning to bring in a labour shop, a labour sweatshop market into the back door. That's what it's suddenly trying to do. Big profits, big profits involved for corporations, low wages, excellent idea. 
trebles all round. And a former employee of Sports Direct's predecessor, which was called Sports Soccer, came as little surprise to him to learn that his company had become one of the first targets of uh, an organisation called You Fight for Jobs. Uh, they had a new this new initiative, and interestingly uh, enough, he writes that uh, it's now it was called Sports Soccer, which is Sports Direct, and uh, this is um, the opinion expressed here may not be the opinion of Breaking the Matrix nor the opinions of Planet X. However, it does state that Sports Soccer, Sports Direct's policy at the store I worked at, was to hire as many people as they could onto zero-hour contracts, which put a lot of reserve labour at their disposal. The deal was, if you step out of line once, or we don't like the look of you, we will give you hours to somebody else. It was store policy that you had to be on the shop floor ten minutes before your shift started, which was unpaid. In short, every six shifts they got a free hour out of you. In fact, that's common, actually. In fact, they got a lot more than that. It was also made clear to you at the interview that you were expected at the end of the day to tidy the store, which again was unpaid and usually took between 30 to 45 minutes more free labour. Shop floor workers, I am sure you are shocked to learn, were on minimum wage. Minimum wage jobs for young working class people and university graduates were not uncommon even back then. Had it been merely the wage and the zero hour contract, I would not have labelled them the worst company I have ever worked for. What tips the balance was the shockingly indignant way they treated me and the rest of the workforce. As an employee, you were not considered to be worthy of entering the shop via the front entrance. You had to go in via the back door. There was also a big sign on the back door that if you opened it without a supervisor present, you would face immediate dismissal for the crime of opening a door. Worst of all, you were basically treated as a criminal and subjected to a body and bag search at the end of every shift. It is about time the shockingly bad way Mr. Ashley treats his employees is brought into the public spotlight. Jellyfish who have illegally settled in the UK have been told to go home by the government. Ice cream vans have been touring seaside resorts where these illegal immigrants are known to be lurking in an effort to get them to leave before they are prosecuted. Bing Crosby, who is currently advising the Tories on how to win the next election, is sure the campaign will gain electoral support at the grassroots. I spoke to the Daily Mail and they are in favour of kicking out these unwanted jellyfish. He has told PM David Cameron. The people have spoken, Cameron told the backbench committee. It is clear that the British people want to see the back of these jellyfish. However, Nick Clegg, Deputy BM, has said the campaign against jellyfish is foolish. They're doing no harm here, he told a bunch of holiday makers on the Blackpool Sands. In fact, they make quite a good meal. I recommend jellyfish soup. Cameron is planning to ban all pictures of jellyfish from the internet in an effort to win women to his cause. His advisor, Bing Crosby, is confident that making a fuss about prawns is a vote winner. And of course, dear listener, we couldn't leave. Breaking the Matrix couldn't actually um, avoid the hilarious, witless article of a PR opportunity by the one and only former Apprentice star, Katie Hopkins, a broadcaster and businesswoman, uh, who the owner of the uh, uh, the owner of a very famous bra company told her to go and stick it. And listeners, you're not going to believe what you're about to read here. It's hilarious, and I'm going to big it up and send it up as best I can. I thought about doing it in the manner of one of those uh, voiceovers that advertise an adult sex channel, uh, because it's just absolutely insane what is being written here regarding zero hours contracts by Katie Hatton Hopkins. Have a listen at this. I thought about it, but we'll see how it voices over. Have a listen anyway and have a laugh, because I, I just find it hilarious that this is a blatant, witless attempt at jumping on the PR bandwagon, and it's also out of touch completely with what is going on with low-paid work in the UK at the moment. But this are the, these are the thoughts of some of the upper-class people uh, in the UK who think that zero-hours contracts uh, is a good thing. As an employer in a small business, I fully endorse the use of zero-hours contracts to create a more dynamic, responsive workforce. Zero-hours contracts make perfect sense to fulfil the demand for temporary workers in casual positions. They allow the employer to flex their staffing muscle according to the needs of the business and the whims of the customer. Zero-hours contracts create an innate sense of competition found in all self-employed people that I work with that makes people hungry 
hungry for work. People perform better on a zero-hours contract. Every hour they deliver for that business is another hour's work they may gain later in the week. In our working world, sick days have become manifest, as normal as a tea break or a bank holiday. Zero hours contracts dramatically reduces the number of days sick taken by an employee. It seems people are far less sick when it's in their own wage they are costing themselves. As an employer, I admire the ambition of Sports Direct founder Mike Ashley. 90% of his staff, all 20,000 part-time workers, are on zero hours contracts. Following the push for a formal inquiry into this area, Mr. Ashley may be called to Westminster to answer questions on why so many of his staff are on these informal contracts. Like so many of us struggling to create jobs, I do not doubt he has grown tired of employment legislation that appears to be written entirely for the benefit of the employee to the detriment of the employer. A zero-hours contract reduces a number of employment provisions, notice periods and unfair dismissal and can be avoided. Wages are driven down, pension and sickness benefits are limited. Meanwhile, the company can maintain an all-on-call workforce that take nothing for granted and understand their next shift is dependent on their performance at their last. I'm always amazed by the resilience of my self-employed colleagues, recognising they cannot take a holiday without paying the price. Forever on call, always saying yes to work, working weekends, anti-social hours, always charming, polite, gracious. A makeup artist kindly working to make me camera ready, no mean feat, ha 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 ha, for Australian Breakfast TV arrived at midnight for the booking. She insisted it was no problem and that her two hour journey home was just a hop and a skip away. Zero hours contracts create a positive tension in a workforce. It's a tension that the self-employed understand as naturally as the reason they never turn down work and will always say yes, no matter how far they have to travel and no matter what personal cost. My God, Katie, that is the way forward. So I'm standing to attention. I'm standing to salute you. This is Breaking the Matrix. I am Tony Topping. Good night. A Syrian village is liberated by rebels who then force Christians to convert to Islam, reports the Mail Online. Dated the 8th of September 2013, Syrian rebels, including Al-Qaeda-linked fighters, have gained control of a Christian village northeast of the capital of Damascus. Government media has provided a different account, suggesting regime forces are winning. The battle is taking place at Malula, a scenic mountain village where people still speak the ancient Middle Eastern language of Aramaic. Terrified Christians claim Syrian rebels ordered them to convert to Islam on pain of death when they liberated their ancient village. Opposition forces, including fighters linked to Al-Qaeda, gained temporary control of the Christian village of Malula after fighting with regime forces. The reports have reignited fears about Western support for the rebel groups which are increasingly being infiltrated by Islamic extremists. On one at Malula, a resident said the rebels, many of whom had beards and shouted Allah Akbar, God is great, attacked Christian homes and churches shortly after moving into the village. They shot and killed people. I heard gunshots and then I saw three bodies lying in the middle of a street in the old quarters of the village. Where is President Obama to see what has befallen us? Another Christian resident said, I saw the militants grabbing five villagers and threatening them and saying, either you convert to Islam or you will be beheaded. Another said one church had been torched and gunmen stormed into two other churches and robbed them. The beautiful mountain village, 25 miles from Damascus, is one of the few places in the world where residents still use the ancient language of Aramaic, which was spoken by Jesus and his disciples. It has become a key strategic battleground in the Syrian civil war because of its proximity to the capital. It was held by President Assad's regime, but taken at the weekend in a rebel advance spearheaded by the hardline Islamist al nazir are a front visive by anybody's standards. Atos have successfully made the blind able to see, the paralyzed able to walk, and in five cases 
brought back five people who were officially dead. Such a miracle requires recognition, said Mission, and for this reason Atos will be beatified and later canonised once the paperwork has gone through. This will be the first time that an organisation has been made into a saint by the Catholic Church, but probably won't be the last. We have heard that Finnus have managed to feed 5,000 people using just four fish, said Mission. That too is a miracle, whilst BP have managed to create a plague of dead rotting fish upon their enemies. The Catholic Church has finally realised what governments have realised a long time ago. Organisations can be classed as people and treated as such. In an ironic twist, Atos will be the patron saint of the out of work. It's breaking the matrix, it's 10pm, I am Tony Topping. The Muslim Brotherhood and its supporters have begun forcing the roughly 15,000 Christian cops of Dalga village in Egypt to pay a jizya tax, as indicated in Quran at 9.29, author and translator Raymond Ibrahim reported on Sunday. Jizya is the money or tribute that conquered non-Muslims historically had to pay their Islamic overlords with willing submission and while feeling themselves subdued to safeguard their existence, Mr. Ibrahim explained. According to Yunis Shakwa, who spoke yesterday to Dosta reporters in Dalga, all cops in the village, without exception, are being forced to pay the tax. The value of the tribute and method of payment differ from one place to another in the village, so that some are being expected to pay 200 Egyptian pounds per day, others 500 Egyptian pounds per day, Mr. Shawik said, according to the translator. In some cases, families not able to pay have been attacked, as many as 40 Christian families have now fled Dauga, Mr. Ibrahim reported. The taxes are not unique to Egypt either. Just over the weekend, Syrian rebels went into a Christian man's shop and gave him free options. Become Muslim, pay $70,000 as a tax levied on non-Muslims known as jizya, or be killed along with his family, Christian Science Monitor reported. So, round of applause all around there to HMG, who are funding the rebels in Syria. Well done them. You're listening to Planet X. Planet X, the biggest paranormal show on radio. Reporter Megan Akinele of Associated Press reports Obama's war on Syria is really about Iran and Israel instead of chemical use, claims critics, as highlighted in an article in the Daily Mail. Critics of President Obama say that he has been hiding the true reason for the proposed military strikes on Syria and actually wants to topple the Iranian government. The skeptics think that in spite of his impassioned principal pleas to gain support so the US can hit Syria in response to their alleged use of chemical weapons, the real motivation for becoming a player in the country's civil war is to prevent any harm being done to Israel. The Nation correspondent Bob Dreyfus called the proposed intervention in Syria much lobbied for, illegal and strategically incompetent, and all based around the mass goal of protecting Israel. Should the US strike, experts fear that either Syria or its ally Iran will retaliate, and one of the most likely targets is Israel. American ties to Israel have been around since the country's creation, and President Obama Obama has reiterated those close corrections throughout his term. The White House has intrinsically linked the Syrian conflict and Iran, a country that openly hates America. Between now and Tuesday, when Congress votes on the prospect of military action in Syria, this is not a drill. I repeat, this is not a drill. Do not be afraid. We are now in control of what you hear. One, two, three, testing. A journey to the far reaches of knowledge and the unknown. I can't believe I just saw that. From aliens to angels, conspiracies to cover-ups. One soul and preeminent power. From extraterrestrials to exposing the truth. I'll try to explain as much as I can. You're listening to Planet X. You're listening to Planet X. Planet X. This is Breaking the Matrix. I am Tony Topping. This is Planet X. Planet X. 
Atos to be canonised by the Catholic Church. Atos, the French company that has been charged by the Department for Work and Pensions to determine the disability payments for the people of the UK, will be canonised by the Catholic Church after a criticism from leader of the opposition, Ed Miliband. Basically, said Ed Miliband, I said that after Atos had been put in charge, the number of disabled claimants had been unfairly reduced by 30,000 people. People who were disabled last week were not disabled this week. The Pope, the elected representative of God on Earth, at least according to one religion, got wind of this comment and investigated. We have investigated the claim, said Deacon Mission, head of the Catholic Church Center Department, and we concur with Mr. Miliband's assessment that Atos has made 30,000 people no longer disabled. That is a better rate than Jesus! He only managed it with a handful. 30,000 is impressed. Mr. Obama is forced to convince a majority of representatives that the strike is in America's best interest. In doing so, the prospect of a retaliatory Iran has been regularly brought up. Mohammed Zarif, the foreign minister of Iran, made a pointed statement during a visit to Iraq on Sunday, warning that his country would like America to stay out of the region. I do not know why those who say all options are on the table do not understand the fact that civilized countries 65 years ago rejected in the Charter of the United Nations the resort to force as an illegal practice, he said. In an effort to drive the point home, he broke away from his native Farisi during a press conference to say these words in English in comments clearly directed at the United States and its allies. The president said that if America action is taken, it will not involve soldiers being shipped to Syria. This would not be another Iraq or Afghanistan, Obama declared in his weekly radio address, previewing arguments he will make in a nationally televised address on Tuesday. I know that the American people are weary after a decade of war, even as the war in Iraq has ended and the war in Afghanistan is winding down. That's why we're not putting our troops in the middle of somebody else's war, Obama said. Israel is not taking any chances that there will be retaliatory measures taken at their expense. The Israel military has deployed an Iron Dome de missile defence battery in the outskirts of Jerusalem. Israel is concerned that Syria or a group allied with the regime like Hezbollah based in Lebanon could launch missiles at Israel if the US attacks over its alleged use of chemical weapons against civilians. Even though Israel believes it's unlikely that Syria will attack the Jewish state, it is making preparations just in case. It has deployed air defense systems, drafted a small amount of reserve soldiers and is handing out gas masks. The Iron Dome system has shot down hundreds of rockets launched by Hamas militants in the Gaza Strip and Israeli cities. Planet X. The truth is on air.